Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To join me, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and sign up for a free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter where I share how to reduce risk, create, grow, and protect your wealth. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, Connor Steinbrook. Connor, are you ready to join the mission? Let's do it. I'm ready to join the mission. Let's let's get it on with. Let's do it. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to have you on, and I've got a little preview of your story. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you, listen up, pay attention, because this is interesting. Let me introduce you to the audience Connor is the founder of the EXP Realty uh, Wolfpack Revenue Share Organization, which has more than 2,700 agents operating in all 50 U.S. states and 12 different countries. The group closed almost 10,000 houses and $3.5 billion in sales in 2022. Connor, take a minute and tell us about the unique value you are bringing to this wonderful world. Yeah, so um, I had a weird back. I went off to college in 2003 and put $20 on a poker site. My hobby became my profession. And for eight years, I became one of the top online poker players in the world. Government regulation kicked in in 2011 on April 15th, and I lost my career overnight. It really broke my mindset. It, it took my identity away. And for years, I played for me. And I fell down uh, the path of you know personal uh, responsibility and self-development. And I came across you know Think and Grow Rich, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and I went heavily into personal development. And I have a very substantial background in emotion management, behavior management, where I can help entrepreneurs get out of uh, self-esteem issues, anxiety issues, um, belief issues, and all sorts of different things that keep people from uh, that keep people procrastinating and self-sabotaging. And so, one of the things I've been able to do is I went through that kind of testifier that I passed through. So I've been there and I know how to get out of it. And I've been able to help a lot of entrepreneurs kind of get out of that broken mindset. And I think that that's a big reason why people come with us and stay with us and grow with us is you build the mindset first and the business builds itself around the mindset. But um, that's really what I focus a lot on with training agents and training entrepreneurs. That's interesting because a lot of times when we have people on, you know, they'll talk about their business and all that, but you're talking about mindset. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. And so having a lot of different people that you work with that are in your organization, like maybe you could give us some idea about like what's the most common issue that you see. And maybe I suspect that some of ourselves, myself and my other listeners, you know, are out there thinking, hmm, that could be my, that could be my challenge. And then from that, maybe one idea about how we could improve. Yeah, I mean, you know, like when you start anything new, let's say you're starting a business, uh, excitement's always the highest and the belief system is always the highest because you haven't had any adversity yet. And then what happens is you get in there and out of emotion and then anything that you're going to drive is as far as a vehicle to your future goals. It doesn't matter if it's insurance, real estate, whatever it is, it's going to get tough. And what happens is when it gets tough, the excitement that they had kind of starts and people get into a mindset battle where uh, we have three expenses in business. We have expenses of time, money, and emotion. And they get to a point where they start thinking the the time, money, and emotion that I'm spending to get to where I'm going is not working out here. And the risk starts picking up in their mind the longer they go along their journey without seeing results. And they start to get the price is too high to pay. What if I don't make it? And that's when people kind of pull back. And if you can't push through what we call the valley of the death, which is kind of that window of the beginning, 6, 12, 18, sometimes three years for business owners to kind of get through that uh, window before they build their skill sets and their business starts making money, they're going to quit. And then they're going to quit what they're doing now, go to the next thing they're going to quit right before they quit the next thing they're about to quit. And they're always going to have that quitting pattern because it's a, it's a mindset and it's a, it's a thought process issue. So mm -hmm. what I do is I help them understand this and I give them stories. Um, a lot of times helping people through their own problems is to tell stories of someone that's a, a similar avatar of them and help them understand that we live in the past, the present, and the future. And in the present right now, the way that we show up in the future with the things that we want, because the only way we're going to have what we want is in the future because we don't have them today is to study our past. And then we go and study the past, past wins, past losses. I help them see kind of where they're at from the past, how they got to where they're at in the present. And I help them understand that they're in the middle of the movie or it's halftime at the, at the football game and they're down 28 to three. But look what can happen at the end of the movie. So you want to help people uh, understand time horizons and also understand that it's normal for them to struggle. And it's not something that 
uh, is unique to them where they feel alone, that it's very common, and that these tests that they're going through in these problems, these are opportunities to show that they're strong enough to have bigger problems tomorrow, and that they need to conduct themselves in a way that these problems that they have now are not that big, because if they can't handle the current problems, the world or God, however their belief system is, will not give them bigger problems tomorrow. So I really help them understand through past stories of my own, other people that they can see themselves in, because stories are a very powerful motivator when people see themselves in that story. It's kind of one of the ways that we, one of the, one of the strategies we use to get people out of those mindset blocks. So time, money, and emotion, and that we're going to face that valley of death and going to have to figure yeah. out how we get through. And, you know, one of the challenging things is that there's occasionally a valley of death that you should get out of, but you got to also decide, is this a valley of death that I need to make it through and get to the other side? And then uh, I think what's fascinating what you talked about is the stories, because uh, for instance, I, I have something I call the, I, my course, which is called the Valuation Masterclass Bootcamp. And it's super tough. Okay. And, you know, and I tell them from the beginning, like 30% of people won't make it to the end. And, you know, uh, and I'm going to put on a lot of pressure and it's going to be tough and, you know, you're going to have problems, but you, you can make it, but <clears throat> I'm not telling enough stories. So I just listening to what you've said. And I think for the listeners out there, make sure that you're incorporating stories. I, I do use stories a lot with, with potential clients and things like that to help them understand like, okay, I've, I've been through this with someone else and this is similar to what you're in. But in this case, I think this is an area that I need to improve on that. So for the listeners out there, where can you help people go through a journey to get through that valley of death by applying a story and or a series of stories? And I think that's super valuable for all of us. Yeah, actually, um, <clears throat> I, I created actually a new YouTube channel. So I have a previous YouTube channel, Investor Army, which is for my investments and the residential side of the business. But I created a new entrepreneurship channel, which is just my personal brand. Uh, my name, Connor Steinberg. And I actually created that channel in a, in a very unique way where I started it knowing how I was going to build it out from the first video in a sequential order process. So if you guys are broken, you're struggling, you know, the pandemic and all that really uh, upset life for a lot of people and uh, changed life for a lot of people. And I know a lot of people are setting over and I had that poker career and I had to start over and go to a, through a different direction. So I knew exactly what I did looking in hindsight and the order I did it. And so that channel if you start from video one and watch them in order, I give you the exact step-by-step -step process to go from a broken person in every way, broken mentally, physically, spiritually, every single part of, you, part of you is broken. What I did first, what I did next in a sequential order and how I got myself out of that situation. And uh, in that process of those videos, there's actually multiple videos. A number of them talk about stories and the importance of a story, but there's actually a couple in there. If you go to my channel that are specifically on a story and it'll be in the mm -hmm. title or the thumbnail. I can't think of exactly what they're yep. called, but um, you should be able yep. to track them down. But um, yep. well, we'll have I've links watched to that. them from start to finish in order. They all kind of run together. We're definitely going to have links to that in the show notes, and I'm looking forward to checking it out myself. Well, now it's time to share your worst <laughs> nice. investment ever. And since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us about the circumstance leading up to it and then tell us your story. Yeah. So I jumped into real estate and I jumped in head over heels and it was not a good experience for me in the beginning. I actually got myself into some pretty big debt. I was a hundred thousand dollars in debt at one point and I was just still kind of battling to come out of this. And I remember I get a, a lead that came in from a Craigslist lead of all, of all places. I was posting ads on Craigslist. It's one of our marketing channels. And uh, I get a, uh, just a normal appointment to go out, check our property out. <laughs> and I get there and the guy's not even there. And it was like an old 19, forget what it was, it was an older house. It was looked like a single family house, but it's actually kind of a built in a duplex type of way, where it was a mirrored, if you drew a wall down the middle, it was mirrored, but it was actually connected in the back. So it wasn't a duplex, but it was kind of like a duplex. And I just remember being like, this is a weird property. It was in a really high price point area. And he was asking an amount for it that didn't make sense. He was asking like a, a very low amount. And this was a much more expensive property. And what he was doing was he was looking at, the tax record, it somehow at one point was a duplex and he was looking at like half the duplex. So he looked at the tax assessed value. So he thought it was worth half. It'll make sense when we get to this point why he's doing that. But um, so I was like, this is such a, this doesn't seem right. This is, seems like there, you don't, you don't get people want to sell their house this, this cheap is kind of what it felt like. And he never showed up and I'm sitting there waiting to go in. And eventually I just figured he flaked on me. And so I was like, I'm out of here, you know, and I start driving home. I'm about 15 minutes on the highway back and he calls me and I'm like, he says he's coming to the property. I'm like, well, I'm already halfway home, but the numbers look so good. So I decided to go back mm. and he said the door is open and this is where it got kind of crazy. So I go into the house 
And it was like a, a horror movie in a way, kind of because he had taken um, saran wrap or whatever that kitchen foil is, that shiny stuff, mm-hmm. put it all over the walls, all over the windows, had com- like blankets and comforters blocking off all the windows. And I was like, oh no, what did I get myself into? And it was a rundown house and just like any other investment property you've all, y'all walked into. And he gave me permission. So I walked in and I'm walking through his house, looking around and I go into the back and I'm coming to the front room. And uh, this is where it got really creepy because I was sitting there and I'm in the middle of this house. It's completely dark. It's like noon outside is bright and sunny, but inside it's blacked out. And so I remember getting a text message and I looked down at my phone and I'm responding to it. And all of a sudden I braced myself like I was getting attacked. I thought there was like a homeless person in the house that was running up on me to attack me. And I braced myself and I'm, I'm not a small guy. I'm six foot, 200 10 pounds, you know, and I I work out. And uh, so I'm like, who's coming, you know, like I'm getting ready to throw down. Nobody was there. And I was like, this is the weirdest thing. And I, and I literally went outside and I was kind of creeped out and I'd never had like any weird things like this happen in my life. And I had one of my partners call me that was a little bit older mentor. And I'm like, Hey, I think I just had like a weird run in with, um, you know, something paranormal or something. I have no idea. Something really weird. He's like, you probably shouldn't talk about that. People are going to think you're crazy. And I was like, okay. Another one of my partners who's a little bit older than me, <clears throat> been in business for a long time, same thing. I was like, have you ever had anything like this happen? And he's like, Connor, probably shouldn't talk about that. It's gonna probably gonna make you sound a little weird and probably shouldn't go down that direction. So I was like, I never said anything about it. So about six weeks later, I'm at a, one of my house flips and I get a phone call and it's actually Detective Montenegro. So if you guys watch that uh, show, The First 48, uh, which is like a murder detective show, the one in Dallas, Detective Montenegro, mm-hmm. he's who called me. And uh, I didn't think it was him at the time. I thought I was getting pranked. And he's like, there's been a, a dead body found at one of the properties. We need you to come basically down to the office. And I'm like, what is going on? Is this, who's, what happened? Is this my, my parents or what's going on? So essentially, I get down there and I was straight good cop, bad cop. They put me in a little cement room, uh, cold room, and <clears throat> didn't come in there for a while. I didn't know it at the time, but I was now the primary suspect or one of the top suspects in a murder case because what had happened was the house that I had gotten uh, under contract, the guy that I thought I was working with was not the real homeowner. He's actually a murderer. He murdered the homeowner. He stole the homeowner's identity, called me, represented that he was the homeowner, fraudulently went into the contracts, and he uh, we went through the entire process, and we got the house closed out. And what had happened was I'd sold the house. I wholesaled the transaction to another investor. And they smelled something coming from the yard as, as horrible as that is. And they thought it was like a sewer break. It was the homeowner that the guy had murdered, buried him in his backyard. And now, as you can imagine, it was a shitstorm. Sorry to cuss if I'm not cuss mm. here. And um, mm-hmm. it blew up all over Dallas News. You guys can go look it up. It was 725 Winnetka in Dallas. Uh, you can look it up uh, and uh, go check out that story. But news broke. It got crazy. And <clears throat> now I'm in the middle of a uh, FBI investigation. Um, so I keep talking or you want to no, that's good. Keep it, keep it going. Let us know. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it was kind of scary because all I remember was watching these TV shows with these people wrongfully in prison for like 20 years and then they Mm. get out later and, you know, and I'm sitting there like, you know, like terrified, like really terrified because I'm like, this is so weird. I'm a straight, like I never do anything wrong. I strive, fly straight. And here I am like as a murder suspect. And I just remember being um, getting called down there. They took the FBI, took my uh, detectives, they took my my computer, my cell phone. They took all the photos off of it. And basically they were trying to figure out, you know, going to the title company, what was going on there. Because actually at the title company, it was kind of crazy. On closing day, the guy brought a briefcase in there and uh, it was already sketchy because he had shaved his head. And I know he personally shaved his head because <laughs> when he turned around, he had like quarter sized spots that he'd missed on the back of his head when, because so I knew he shaved his own head. He didn't even go to like the, uh, uh, you know, like normal haircutting place, which makes sense now knowing what happened. And he'd mm. grown a beard out and he brought his dogs in. It was literally like he was about to skip town. And then like after the uh, closing and he brings a briefcase out when we're right at the end, he's like, he literally thought this, that he was going to get cash. Cause like we run, we buy houses, we pay cash ads, right? He thought he was going to get a briefcase full of cash. And the title company, she was saying, well, you can get a bank wire uh, direct to the bank account or you can get a cashier's check. And he flipped his at that moment. And he started pushing chairs around, screaming at me, like almost coming across the table saying, you're a fraud. You say you pay cash for houses. And we're like, we don't know what's going on at this point. Uh, So if you kind of go back in the story with us and he's thinking he's getting screwed and we're like, you're going to get a check or a wire like it's like, what's the big deal? Because what had happened at that moment, 
he realized he had beat the house sale process, but he couldn't get the money out of the bank account because it was going to go to this guy's bank account. So whatever happened, the, it didn't close at that, t- uh, at that time. And then the next day he sent in like another ID and then there's a couple processes and somehow the title company passed it through. I don't mm-hmm. really know what happened and it went through, but um, yeah, so, so we still don't know what's going on at this point, but like, I just remember telling the title company, he must owe the mafia money or something. Cause I'd never seen something so crazy. Now it makes sense looking back what had happened because at that moment he realized he thought he got through this entire process, murdered someone was going to get scot free. And now he has to get the money out of the bank. And um, what he actually did, he took out $500 at a time or something, a few hundred dollars at a time from every ATM. And he was, they actually had him on cameras in like all these different States taking money out. And there's a big casino <laughs> So crazy. Uh, there's a casino here at the border of Oklahoma and Texas called Windstar Casino, or maybe it's Choctaw. I forget which one. And from what I understand, the detectives told me later because I had to meet with them back and forth. At one point, they realized it wasn't me, and now I was trying to help, you mm-hmm. know, kind of get this guy because he kind of skipped town. He had gone to the casino with like a Santa Claus trash bag of forty thousand dollars. I think they told me uh, maybe a little bit. I forget exactly what it was. It was a decent amount of twenties. Think about how much money you know it is if you're taking 20s out. And he was trying to launder the money to get hundreds. So he brought in this huge uh, trash bag of, and he was so whacked out of his mind. He didn't even need to do this at that time. He could have given his own ID, but he actually gave the ID of the guy he murdered to them. That's how crazy this guy was at the time. And they flagged it because the guy that he, he murdered was like way taller, way older, 20 years older. And uh, from what I was told, they have him on camera. He ran out of the casino and left like $40,000 or something sitting on the uh, cashier's table and just split. And then they were chasing him down for like nine months or something like that. And finally they ran him down, I think in California and he committed another crime. And then uh, it was like a fight to see if we could get him extradited back. But it was um, kind of crazy story. And then I think they ended up changing Texas title law from what I understand over it, because there was an issue with the title company passing the transaction through and then the notary book magically disappeared and it, it just got crazy start to finish but um and is the guy do you know if the guy's story. in jail or yeah. anything about that yeah yeah you guys can look it up his name's uh, i think it was chris colbert uh if you guys type in 725 winnetka w-i-n-n-e-t-k-a dallas i think it was in 2015 and you can find the story uh just type my name in chris colbert 725 winnetka and you'll find it on the internet and uh kind of see what we're talking about but um uh. Amazing. It was a crazy day that was not expected to turn out that direction. And, uh, but, um, yeah. Yeah. Life is um, crazy. Sometimes. My, my, my first reaction <clears throat> is, you know, living outside of America where we don't have first amendment and other protections. Uh, my first question that I had in my mind when you sat down with the investigators was, did you call your lawyer and say, I'm not going to talk until I've, you know, got my lawyer in here. Cause I, I wonder, I always wonder, like people just spill the beans, you know, like when, when they sit down, well, we want to help, you know, and you, and <clears throat> I've seen some great presentations that talk about, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing that you can say to them that's going to help you in a case, particularly when you're innocent. But I'm just curious if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah. So unfortunately, no, <laughs> I was mm. young and stupid. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, in my mind at the time, I knew I had done nothing wrong. So I was like, okay, we'll try that. So like the first, so the first sit down, I think they kind of already knew that like, I probably like, I was possibly a suspect. So like the title company, myself and a few Mm -hmm. others were like the last points of contact, but they had at one point, a few hours into the meeting, um, pulled out a number of photos and one of them was him. And they said, did you wreck? Like, so I think they kind of knew, uh, as it was going through, but, um, <clears throat> no, I should have looking back in the future. I definitely will. I'm just going to say, Hey, look, you know, uh, I just like, I feel like at the time I felt like if I didn't talk, it made me look like I was hiding yeah, something yeah. shady, which is probably like why you sh- still shouldn't talk. Yep. But, um, yeah, mm. I, I, I answered their questions and I just didn't mm. think I had anything to worry about. But then once I left, that's when like the sheer anxiety and the panic. And I yeah. was just like, I just kept thinking about these people that were falsely imprisoned and how they, mm-hmm. somebody has to go down for it. And if they can't pin this other guy or whoever did it, I'm mm-hmm. number one suspect. And yeah. it was like, yeah, it was really scary. Cause like it, a lot of people have fear. That was fear. Like yeah, real, real fear. fear. Like what happens if I wrongly get in prison for the rest of my life and for a murder, like that I did not do anything. Um, so it got kind of, it was kind so, of scary, but so um, how would you summarize the lessons, lessons that you learned from this whole experience? <clears throat> Always be aware. 
that um, no matter where you go, you don't know who you're, uh, where you're going and mm. be safe out there because I've been into some of the worst neighborhoods in North America, uh, like hardcore, like, you know, people get shot, gang activity, drug activity everywhere. This was not in one of those neighborhoods. This was mm. in a, at the time, a, a very nice area of our, our Metroplex, like one of the highest price per square foot. So it's actually like one of the most, un, uh, it, it wasn't expected to happen in that mm. neighborhood, neighborhood in that house. So it can happen anywhere. And just be aware as you're going into properties to meet strangers, guys, like I know that you're trying to change your, change your life, make some money, provide for your family. But this has not just happened once, not this way, but I've also had other crazy situations yep. where, you know, risk came up with my physical safety and danger and things like that. So just think about it. I'm not, you know, don't get mad if I say, you know, some of y'all may think about packing. And if you can do that legally in your state, it is something if you're going to, to these properties by yourself, you have to understand that. If this guy thought he was getting cash, some of these people think they're getting cash. And I've had this situation happen before where people kind of set me up. They thought I was coming to the house with like stacks of cash to buy the mm. house. And if they think that and you're showing up to a house with strangers that think you're bringing cash and then they find out you don't have cash, they're going to be pretty mad. So just mm. uh, be safe out there. And then also that um, now I'll just probably not to talk to the <laughs> you know, detectives without getting an attorney first. That'd be a good little <laughs> something to learn there. Um but yeah, and just just probably just to be aware out there and be safe mm -hmm. and yep. and uh, yeah, that's probably yep. the most because that kind of shocked me after that where it's like okay now I need to be a little bit safer because I used to just walk into random properties and uh, you know there's times where I go upstairs and mm -hmm. trap people upstairs where mm -hmm. there's one stairway down yep. and I've gone into rooms where I knew people were sitting in the closet and I could see heroin needles and you know all sorts of stuff so like you just <clears> got to <throat> be careful what, with what you guys are doing yep. uh, it's not like HGTV it's yep. a real world where people live and you're out there in their environment so uh <clears throat> the one thing I would say is that uh you know it things happen when they're least expected you know, like you said, in a neighborhood that right. you thought, oh, this is going to happen here. It's like when you're least prepared and least, uh, you know, expecting it. And so also I would highlight that it comes in a lot of different forms. You know, we're talking in this case about physical, you know, risk and stuff, but it also comes into risk related to somebody reaching out with basically with a scam and trying to figure out, you know, when you're vulnerable and you're trying to turn yourself around and you're trying to make more money. I, I had a <clears throat> a former student of mine who called me to say that they've got this opportunity and it's a really great opportunity and someone's called them and given it to them. And, you know, what do I think about it? And, you know, and I <clears throat> was able to talk to them and say, you know, this is a scam. And basically it's an unlicensed and unregistered securities being sold into Thailand. And that has to be registered. You'd have to be registered by the securities and exchange commission and all that. And they didn't know any of that. And so I think the awareness, being aware and asking people for help and advice and ideas helps you to, to get through this. So let me just ask another question is based upon what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn, uh, is it something that you can think about, like one action that you could have done or that would have helped to prevent or that listeners can do if they face this type of situation to help them, um, you know, suffer the same fate? Well, I hope somebody doesn't have to kind of run into that situation. Um, probably just, you know, if you have the ability to do so and have another person go with you to the property, uh, that'd be, especially if you're a woman, uh, that's one yep. thing. Um, it's, it's dangerous out there. Yep. Make sure you kind of have the awareness while you're on the phone call, ask, ask the right questions while you're on the phone call. Mm. You kind of, you know, ask, like if I had started, asking some questions in that situation ahead of time you know but like so who owned the property before it was your parents and like i would have sniffed out because he wouldn't have had to answer so right. get more data up front just ask around and um yeah, i would say like one. also just one of the things is like a lot of you guys think unilaterally in your own mindset so this is what why i can get caught by this stuff and why you could get because if you don't want to commit crimes and you're not going to murder people and you're not going to go do all these bad things you can't think like they think and so this is like, you're just saying this happens randomly whenever it's just like a Tuesday or Monday, whatever day it was, it'd just be like if tomorrow, this was the day. So yeah. when crazy things happen in life, it just happens lifetime and you're never expecting and it's just a normal day. Mm. And uh, it's kind of surreal. Like when I was going through, it was like, is this really happening? Is it didn't actually yep. seem that intense, but it was yep. massively intense at the same time. Yep. But just to understand that just because you wouldn't do something or you 
when think that this could happen doesn't mean that like people think the way you do and that they're not setting you up. And like one of the things that, you know, talking about like, um, you know, issues and things that you can run into, there's a lot of people that are doing mortgage fraud and like uh, mortgage, you know, stealing money with private lenders and things like that. And um, you just really want to make sure that if you're going to wire money to a title company, you're wiring it directly to the title company. And like, you're making sure that the, everything is on the up and up because mm -hmm. there's a lot of scam artists out there. And, and yep. as the internet gets more, um, the internet's created a lot of opportunities for people to scam people. So just before you do anything, double, triple, quadruple check, uh, and you're going to probably avoid a lot of mistakes that you could have uh, if you didn't kind of take the time to do more due diligence and be a little bit smarter on the front side. Yep. But I think a lot of people jump in, they're not expecting there, there's that many bad people out there in the business. I'm not trying to freak you guys out, but in every world, you take a hundred people, you're going to have saints and then devils and everything mm -hmm. in between. And so just know that the law of averages, if you're active in the business, you will eventually come across some craziness at some okay. point. So. so what's a resource you'd recommend for our listeners? Yeah. I mean, the book that changed my life, uh, probably heard about it. it's called thing of rich it's not mm -hmm. to be cliche whatsoever but uh when i hit rock bottom i was lost in life and i came across uh napoleon hill not thinking we're rich first but i came across his black and white recordings of his 17 principles of success mm -hmm. and i just remember it hit really hard with me because i it wasn't like he was trying to sell me something there's no home study course there's no pitch he was generations beyond and he was already passed away and it just what he was talking about resonated with me that it was generational that if it worked in his day, you know, at the turn of the century, it's working now. So it, it seemed to be honest generational knowledge. And that's when I went through his principles of success recordings. And that led me to Think and Go Rich, uh, his other books like Outwitting the Devil. And mm -hmm. then I went down heavy personal education, self-development. And I read a lot of the, the ones like As a Man Thinketh by James uh, Allen, Richest Man in Babylon. And then mm -hmm. I went into uh, a big personal education wave of my life for about five years where I went down the rabbit hole with all the, the OGs, the good ones, the, the Jim Rohns, Bob Proctors, Zig Ziglar's, Les Browns, mm -hmm. uh, John Maxwell's, and uh, really went down that path. And that, that's what changed my life, by yeah. the way, is mm -hmm. that when I fell into personal education and in the process of becoming more than I was at the moment in all areas of my life, that really kind of, uh, and I can see it with all the books behind you, this big part of your life as well. But um, oh, yeah. it wasn't my college education, it was my personal education that changed my life. So yep. just that's keep great. that into consideration, guys, if you want, want your freedom. Educate yourself and great, educate great yourself with entrepreneurs. Yeah, great advice. And we'll we'll put the the links in the show notes to some of those books that you've recommended because they are amazing. Last question: yep. What's your number one goal for the next twelve months? Next twelve months. Um, so my number one goal in general right now is to get our EXP organization to ten thousand agents. So if you're global and you want to partner with us, uh, we're only almost three thousand, so we got a lot of room for you guys to come in with us. But um, my my twelve month goal is to get that to four thousand agents. So we'll, we'll get that to four thousand. Um, I'm pretty sure. Mm. But um, and then I'm looking to on my investment side. So that would be on the agent side. So I do agent side and investment side. Um, I'm looking to. There's a new lake being built here north of Dallas, um, <clears throat> just at an hour and a half northeast of D uh, the DFW Metroplex. I'm going to be developing some properties out there, storage unit properties, boat storage, and things like that. Um, is where I want to put some of my long-term uh, money. So those are some of the things I'm focusing on. And then uh, I'd like to get my new YouTube channel, the one that's mm. Connor Steinberg, up to 10,000 10, subscribers this year would be good. And then I'm looking to attract, uh, probably sponsor and, and bring about 25 agents personally uh, over to eXp this year uh, to get a chance to work with me directly. So if you guys mm. are looking for a sponsor, looking to come to eXp, just hit me up. We'll have a conversation. I'll show you what we do behind the scenes, all the courses, training systems, uh, we give out all our investment coaching, our social media trainings, and all our uh, mindset, personal education, and uh, the things that we do behind the scenes. I'll go over with you on that call. Sounds amazing. So um, listeners, there you have it. Another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives and stay out of murder cases. If you've not yet joined yeah. the mission, just go to myworstinvestmentever.com and join my free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter to reduce risk in your life. As we conclude, Connor, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Yeah, just uh, believe in yourself, never stop, and it will all work out for you. And uh, it's only when you stop believing in yourself and stop 
trying for your goals that it doesn't. So just keep going. You can do this and everybody has the right to be successful if you deserve it, but you got to deserve it. So you can go mm-hmm. work hard over the same period of time and never give up and you will get there. Beautiful. And uh, I love the initial part where we talked about, and you talked about time, money, and emotion and getting through that valley of death. Let's use Connor as an inspiration for all of us when we face that challenge and we're not sure if we can go on, but we really should push through it. Let's use the inspiration that we've learned here. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well fellow risk takers. Let's celebrate that today. We added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.